Without further ado, please welcome Annie Laurie Gaylor. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make a few brief remarks and then introduce the panelists and get out of the way. But I did want to say that um, this room is full of people who could be on panels too. So if you haven't introduced yourself to your sister neighbor, I mean, we have the editor of the Humanist Magazine here. We have Linda Lascola, a researcher working with Daniel Dennett on the Clergy Project. Um, Catherine Dunphy, who is the secretary of the Clergy Project. This is helping atheist pastors in the closet get out. Um, Jessica Alquist is here. So you never know who you're sitting next to. Um, and uh, first I wanted to throw out a couple of things. I think that some of our panelists are going to continue the discussion about the war against women. And to that end, uh, some of you may have seen the It's Time to Quit the Catholic Church ad that ran in the New York Times in March, which I wrote and FFRF put out. And it's still creating shock waves. It came up at the stockholders meeting at the New York Times. And we decided to put it in the Washington Post, uh, May 2nd. And that doesn't have the national distribution, but the Catholic columnist, uh, Dion, Dion, I don't know how you say his name, went after it. And then today, um, the ombudsman, Patrick Pexton, has a column, Is the Post Anti-Catholic? It's the Sunday <laughs> column that comes out today. So um, that, I think, is the issue of feminism and state church of the day, the attack by the bishops and the fundamentalists against the right to contraception, attacking the contraceptive mandate. Um, and then I think that we probably will also be touching on male domination of many of the conferences and why that happens and what to do about it. But each of our panelists has prepared some remarks, introductory remarks, and then we'll kind of I guess talk amongst ourselves and take questions. And I'm going to introduce all of them and then they will proceed in order. Sakivu Hutchinson is Senior Intergroup Specialist for the Los Angeles County Human Relations Commission and Project Director of the Women's Leadership Project, a high school feminist mentoring program. She's the author of Imagining Transit, Race, Gender, and Transportation Politics in Los Angeles and Moral Combat, Black Atheists, Gender Politics and the Values Wars, and the forthcoming Godless Americana, Race and Religious Rebels, which sounds fascinating. In 2010, she founded Black Skeptics Los Angeles. She will be followed by Rebecca Watson, who leads an international team of skeptical activists on the six sites that make up the Skeptic Network. Rebecca is also co-hosts The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, one of the most popular science podcasts in the world with more than 120,000 weekly listeners. She travels around the world delivering talks on science, atheism, feminism, and skepticism. And there is currently an asteroid orbiting the sun with her name on it. <laughs> <laughs> then we all hear from Ophelia Benson, She's a writer and blogger and runs a website called Butterflies and Wheels that's been for 10 years. She has a blog of the same name that has uh, moved to the Free Thought Blogs website. She's co-authored three books, all of them with Jeremy Stangroom, The Dictionary of Fashionable Nonsense, Why Truth Matters, and Does God Hate Women? I think we know the answer to that. <laughs> Uh, she is associate editor of the Philosopher's Magazine. She's been doing that for six years, and she has a column there and also with Free Inquiry. And then we will hear from Jennifer McWright. Am I saying that right? Yes. <laughs> Jen blogs about atheism, feminism, science, and sex at BlagHag. She's a member of the Free Thought Blogs Network. She's vice chair of the board of directors of the Secular Student Alliance and a contributor to the Atheist's Guide to Christmas. She was recently listed as one of Moore Magazine's top new feminists. Her day job is geeking out about human genetics and evolution as a PhD student at the University of Washington. And now we'll hear from Sikivu. Good morning, good to be here. 
Um, since this is the 20th anniversary of the LA civil unrest, aka the LA riots, the so-called Rodney King riots within mainstream media imagination, I'm going to frame my comments about the intersection of feminism and non-theism a little bit differently. I grew up in South LA in the 1970s and 1980s, and this was a period in which police terrorism against communities of color was more or less a fact of life, and it still is a fact of life. Um, and this was a period in which the LAPD was led by a white supremacist named Daryl Gates that some of you older folk may be familiar with, the Daryl Gates regime. And Gates notoriously claimed that African Americans responded differently to chokeholds. And so this was one of the primary means of fascism during the Gates regime. And one of my first memories of going to a political protest as a child was in 1979, after the murder of an African-American woman named Eula Love, who was killed by two LAPD police officers in her home after she allegedly wielded a knife at them. And my impressions of this murder really resonated deeply with me at the time because it was hard for me to believe as a child that this was a woman a mother who had been murdered in her own home. And in my child's mind, this was an atrocity because home was supposed to be safe space and private sanctuary. But the contradiction for African American women is that home historically has not been safe space and private sanctuary because of the ways in which African American women have been inscribed as less than human, as less than female, as sexualized, racially othered bodies for public control and consumption. And this obviously was articulated during the slave regime whereby African American women's reproduction was strictly controlled to buttress the plantation economy. And this dynamic informs policies of mass incarceration that disproportionately lock up African American women at staggeringly egregious rates for nonviolent drug offenses, such that you have whole generations of young African Americans that are disproportionately assigned to foster care, that are homeless, and whole populations within our community that are disenfranchised from living wage employment. And so the question for me as an African American humanist feminist is, we cannot frame the so-called war on women strictly in terms of a Christian backlash against abortion rights and family planning if we are not looking at the degree to which women of color have been institutionally criminalized by policies of mass incarceration that intersect with the foreclosing of reproductive justice. So for example, <laughs> this, this narrative that's emerged with the vengeance over the past couple of years that black and Latino women in particular are dangerous breeders is informed by all of this fascistic fetal homicide and chemical endangerment policy that we've seen you know, over the past couple of years passed in Bible Belt states like Alabama and North Carolina and South Carolina that disproportionately criminalizes and targets pregnant African American and Latina and Asian women as well as white working class women has locked up scores of poor working class women on the grounds that the rights of the quote unquote fetus supersede those of the so-called criminal pathological drug using mother. And there have been national activists like the National Advocates for Pregnant Women that have really come at the barricades in looking at radical intersectionality. How do these policies again force and police women into these positions where their constitutional rights are fundamentally being abridged and basically gutted. 
concomitant with that, there has been a House Republican subcommittee bill that was submitted last year that would prohibit so-called race selection abortions. And this is public policy that was trotted out in Georgia, and fortunately was smacked down by the Georgia State Legislature. But it's based on this propaganda that somehow abortion is a leading cause of death for African Americans. And this is rhetoric that was marshaled by a national billboard campaign that was funded by far-right radical groups, the Latino Conservative Partnership and the Radiance Foundation. And these billboards were placed in urban cities throughout the nation. And the tagline was that the most dangerous place for a black or Latino child was in the womb of black and Latino irresponsible breeder mothers. And some of you may be familiar um, with these billboards. They're placed in New York, in Atlanta, in LA, et cetera. So this kind of propaganda also informs anti-undocumented immigrant legislation that has been promoted terroristically, obviously in Arizona with SB 1070, but also again in the Bible Belt, in Alabama and Georgia. And a lot of the propaganda around this legislation portrays Latinas, again, as these dangerous breeders, nationalist rhetoric, Latinas as dangerous breeders who are coming over, dropping so-called anchor babies that were ultimately undermine Americana and steal white heartland jobs. So this is an atmosphere whereby we can see the kind of atrocity that was passed a couple of days ago in the House, the so-called Violence Against Women Act, which only perpetuates more institutionalized violence against women by dis disenfranchising undocumented women and LGBTQ women. And for me, if a secular feminist humanist platform does not have some critical consciousness about the ways in which these policies are foreclosing the human rights of women of color, then there will be no purchase within communities of color, as we can see <laughs> from this audience. And so 30 years after the murder of Eula Love, who never got her lifetime cable channel docudrama, 30 years after the murder of Eula Love, the neighborhood, the community where she was murdered has not changed radically in terms of economic development. What has changed is the impact of the so-called war on drugs on the lives of black and brown women in that community. Again, the skyrocketing rates of foster care assignment and homelessness amongst young people of color. And the fact that returning offenders of color are disproportionately disenfranchised from even getting sub-minimum wage jobs because in order to apply for a job you have to disclose that you had a felony and under California's three strikes law you know for example black and Latino women have really been targeted you know in terms of not being able to receive social welfare benefits not being able to receive housing and so these, for me, are the critical secular issues. Can I just say that it's part dream, part nightmare to be on a panel with someone as awesome as all of these ladies, and particularly Sakibu, I've never seen you talk before, and so to have to follow that is terrifying. Thank you. <laughs> I'm reminded of the, the recent fear-mongering news about uh, uh, minority babies now outnumbering white babies, and the uh, satirical newspaper, The Onion's response, which was, there was another time when uh, babies of color outnumbered white babies in this country, but we took care of that. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I, I want to first uh, address something that Susan Jacoby said earlier, uh, because as 
you know, I'm a skeptic. I, I run Skeptic, and I'm on the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And uh, Susan said that skeptics are more male and more conservative, and I'd like to defend skeptics. Uh, I'd like to, but... <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot. <laughs> I, uh, I do talk a lot about the intersection of feminism and secularism, of feminism and atheism, and feminism and skepticism. And whenever it comes up on the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, as it recently did when I was addressing the recent New Hampshire bill, which luckily did not pass, but had it passed as originally written, it would have forced doctors to give pseudoscientific information to patients, which is the perfect sort of news story for us to talk about on SGU. And so it's odd that it would inspire angry emails. The reason why the angry emails came in is that the patients who would be lied to were women seeking abortions. And I was told point blank that that's not science news. <laughs> Uh, can we please, actually, I, I think I have the, the quote from the emailer. Uh, she, me, it's always addressed to the men. The emails are always addressed to the men, not me. She goes on to opine on the contraception issue. This is science? I would like to suggest that you folks return focus to topical pseudoscience debunking and let that drive your science discussion slash education efforts, i.e. creationism, ID, Darwin, evolution. You are not doing our cause any good by wandering into disputatious feminist, leftist, or insular academic intellections. <laughs> that, that email is wholly unremarkable. I get many like it every time I mention anything uh, that involves crossover between feminist issues and skeptical issues. Uh, I found that atheist audiences are generally a little bit better. Um, when I, I've been given a lot of talks in the past several years specifically about feminist topics and where they cross over uh, with, with secular topics, specifically because I know I'm speaking to an audience of mostly men, usually. This is nice, by the way. <laughs> this is nice. Uh, so I know I'm speaking to an audience that doesn't necessarily share my views on feminism, so I trick them. Uh, the, the, one of the first talks I gave was called Why Chicks Matter. <laughs> and, and so guys like chicks, right? And then I just gave them an angry feminist rant <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> Uh, it worked, and I, I spoke about topics like uh, the um, hunting down and, and murder of witches in, uh, in Africa, for instance, um, which affects mostly older women and children. Uh, that's a really good skeptical secular topic. That's the sort of thing that I think these groups should be discussing more of, but uh, they generally leave it to the feminists to take care of. There's also uh, the pseudoscience that supports female genital mutilation. Um, for instance, FGM is, uh, it makes women cleaner, uh, is one thing um, that is completely wrong. Uh, and, and usually when I, when I talk about these topics to atheists, they're, they accept these, these issues, they understand them, and they agree with me on them. Although I should mention that whenever I mention female genital mutilation, every single time, you know, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Every single time, without fail, during Q&A, one of the first questions will be a man saying, but what does this have to do with my penis? <laughs> Not in so many words. Uh, it would be, you know, but isn't male circumcision worse, really? And I would say no. Uh, I even made a YouTube video once about FGM and how it's not directly comparable to male circumcision. And in that video, I say, for the record, I'm not in favor of male circumcision either, uh, but these are the ways in which it differs from FGM. And I got a torrent of rape threats from atheists about it, um, saying that I was doing them a disservice, them and their mutilated penises. I'm sorry if there are children in the audience. <laughs> uh, so uh, those are some of the topics uh, that I, I tend to discuss. Also things like ultra-orthodox Jewish men throwing feces at little girls going to school. Uh, that happened recently. Um, I also talk about abortion and uh, how the religious right is uh, trying to 
end it, along with stopping women's access to contraception and, and topics like that. And so by and large, the secularists get it. Uh, they get that religion is dangerous for women, and for the most part, they support efforts to protect women from religious bigotry when I bring it up, though it's not necessarily high on their to-do list. It's somewhere just below uh, crossing off in God we trust on their dollar bills. Uh, but for the most part, they get it. So you'd think I'd be happy when I recently saw video from Australia. There was recently a global atheist convention in Australia, and there were Muslim protesters outside and the atheists counter-protested. They were outside facing off with the Muslim protesters. And in this video, you can see the atheists start chanting, where are the women? Where are the women? Because all of the, the Muslim protesters were male. And what's very interesting in the video is you can see that pretty much all of the atheists are male. <laughs> But at no point does any one of them develop self-awareness <laughs> and go like, where are the women? <laughs> no, seriously, where are the women? <laughs> and, and, and just a day or two uh, prior to that, at that convention, their entertainment consisted of uh, several stand-up comedians, one of whom was Jim Jeffries, who, if you haven't heard of him, pat yourself on the back and then just forget I ever said this because... <laughs> Uh, it makes the world a little worse to know about him. Uh, he, at the conference, as part of his bit, he literally talked about how much he hates women. Um, he, many of his jokes, and if you really hate yourself, you can go on YouTube and search for Jim Jeffries and you can see what sort of things he talks about. It's not like this would be a surprise to someone, say, booking him for an atheist convention. He does do a lot of religion bashing, uh, which is, I assume, why they booked him. But he also talks about how much he hates, loathes women. And there were people in the audience, men and women, who were put off by this, offended even. And I found a discussion of it on a forum. And uh, it was a discussion between people who were there. And there were many men, I think they were probably all men, maybe there were some women in there, who uh, were saying, you know, you guys are just too sensitive, you know, you feminazis, uh, humorless, uh, it's just a joke, it's just a joke. They even, uh, some people tried to argue that he was doing a character in which he was speaking as a religious misogynist, <laughs> despite the fact that in the same act he bashed religion, so it doesn't really make sense. Uh, one, uh, one of my favorite quotes on that forum, someone quoted from uh, verse 5, chapter 3 of the book of Hitchens, uh, <laughs> which goes like this, the people who must never have power are the humorless. And of course, knowing what we know about Hitchens and his feelings toward humor in women, I think we can, <laughs> by process of elimination, we can guess who they would like in power. So that was, that was much of the, the response. It was a pushback from other atheists saying, it's not a big deal. Uh, where are the women, you Muslim men? Uh, so many, I think many people, unfortunately, have learned the wrong lesson. I think what they've learned is that misogyny is something religious people do. And in truth, religion didn't invent misogyny. It just codified it. And until we acknowledge the misogyny that exists in our culture at large, our pro-woman chants are just going to be seen as mindless point scoring against the religious, and it's not going to do anyone any good. Thank you. Okay, so now it's my turn to have a tough act to follow. We all have. A lot of what we're talking about here is um, the connection between atheism and feminism and the relationship between the two and why there's a certain tension between the two. And I think one reason for that has to do with what happened um, starting with second wave feminism and the fact that it didn't, it didn't carry all before it instantaneously. And sexism seems to be very entrenched. Um, and what happened, one of the things that happened in reaction to that is that feminism itself 
um, did a sort of compensatory thing of saying, well, okay, you're not gonna, you're not gonna um, let us be totally equal right away. So what we're going to decide is that, is that yes, you're right, we're, we're different, but we're different in a good way. So the thing to do is be different feminists and valorize um, all the things that used to be liabilities. We're nicer, we're more empathetic, we're better at processing emotions, we can read your minds, we, um, we, don't, we don't say cutting things to people, we don't, um, we don't talk about how do you know that, we don't look for evidence, we don't try to think carefully, we're warm, we're approachable, we're family oriented, we're kind of cuddly. And, um, you know, we've had, we've had several decades of this and, and it, has, it has, to a considerable extent, um, taken effect. It's a kind of making lemonade out of lemons thing. So what, what, um, what the result of that is, is that we, you, get, you get the good old Victorian angel in the parlor. And the thing, about, the thing about the angel in the parlor when it comes to atheism is the angel in the parlor seems like exactly the wrong kind of person to put into a battle against God. One, because she's an angel, and two, because she's in the parlor. <laughs> atheism, obviously, um, especially, especially what is called new atheism, which, mean, which means different things to pe different people, but it, um, one thing you can think of it as, as a kind of fight with God, a battle with God, taking God on. That doesn't seem to be a job for um, people who are, who make a big deal out of being warm and approachable and empathetic and above all, nice. So to some extent we, we sort of, if we as feminists have ourselves to blame to the extent that we buy into the, into the idea of um, difference feminism and sort of essentialist differences in women and this is, this is not universal in feminism, and there is a kind of split in feminism itself in which people reject this idea. But it's very popular. I belong to um, a women's studies list, the women's studies list, partly in order to keep track of, of this kind of thing. And it's, it's both surprising and depressing how, um, how entrenched and how popular difference feminism really is with um, women's studies academics. Uh, I, I had always thought, sort of before, before reading more about it, that the, the mainstream, our core feminist idea wasn't that, that it was, it was about being empowered and tough and you, know, you can still be feminine and all that, but you want, you want your power. You don't want to give it up in order to be people-pleasing. And that's, that's not as universal an idea as I always had tended to think it should be. And I think this is a, this is a big disability for um, atheist women. And I think it might be part of the reason why we tend to get um, overlooked when people schedule conferences and um, think about writing anthologies and that kind of thing. It's just, we're not the default sex when it comes to thinking of um, fighting battles with, with God. But the good news is, you know, this is a technological age. The fact is we actually don't need to have testosterone or big muscles to fight God because basically the fight with God is with words. And we can do that. We can do that as, just as well as men and some of us can do it better than most men. These are all averages, but that means we, they're, there's room for plenty of them at the top. But um, things don't change easily, and my favorite recent example of how unexpectedly um, you, can find, you can find quite unabashed sexism, even among people you expect to be um, progressive, and this, this was uh, something on Twitter, forgive me for making an issue of something on Twitter, but Twitter's good for finding stuff that people really don't mind, ought to mind saying, but don't. Just ask Jessica Alquist. Um, and this tweet was, um, you need to know that Ed M is Ed Miliband, a um, labor government figure. 
Quote, what a hero. Fearless protester chucks an egg at Ed M and runs away, like a girl. Throws like a girl, too. Hashtag loser. Well, who wrote that, that tweet? It was a guy called Tom Harris. He's a labor MP for Glasgow South. A labor MP. Wouldn't you think a labor MP would know better than to say, like a girl, throws like a girl, too, loser? But he didn't. So if that kind of contempt for women and hostility to women is that entrenched even in, in people like labor MPs, um, we've got our work cut out for us. And I think, I think um, you know, the only way to do that work is to do it and is to just not get discouraged by the fact that, that contempt and rage against women are still endemic. And um, be persistent and be, um, persistent and obstinate and bloody-minded about it and just keep showing up, talking back, doing what we do, and just um, not surrendering. Now I have the terrifying task of going last after three <laughs> wonderful speakers. Uh, I'm actually gonna zoom out a bit into a more general look at the intersection of atheism and feminism. And when I started blogging, I was primi primarily talking about atheism. I started my blog to kind of document what my Secular Student Alliance group was doing on campus, the one I was president of. And so when I started blogging, I was mainly talking about atheism and I garnered an audience of readers that were mainly f interested in atheism. But I've always considered myself a feminist too, and so occasionally I would talk about feminist topics or where they intersect. And I always got the question of why are you talking about this? You know, why, you're an atheist blog, you shouldn't be talking about feminism. And I sort of developed a talk over the year where years over, the main point is that religious belief and sexist beliefs are really similar in a lot of ways. And a lot of people don't recognize that. Um, and the main one is just religious belief and sexist belief are both irrational and not fact-based. And I, I recognize that not, not all atheists are good skeptics or consider themselves skeptics, um, which is a problem in itself. But if you're a skeptical atheist and you argue, argue against religion for rational reasons, you should also argue against sexism for rational reasons. And I've always said, you know, if, I, if some like, really good concrete evidence exists that shows like a major differences between the sexes, I'm willing to accept that. I mean, I'm a biologist, I'm willing to accept. There's some things that are different, but those things are like men have larger canine teeth than women, and we're not gonna make ethical laws based off that. <laughs> but the other thing, there, there are two more things about religious belief and sexist belief that are really similar that aren't as obvious to a lot of people. I think most people accept that both are fairly irrational. And one is that it's the little things that often matter um, for example, you know, there's a scale on how important maybe a topic seems and how big the effect is. So we can say, you know, religious, if we had to choose between getting rid of in God we trust on money and religious laws that exempt child care, uh, religious child cares from standards and those exemption of standards lead to kids being sick and dying, you know, I would rather make religious child cares, if I had to pick between the two, I'd pick religious child cares having to enforce those standards. I'm like, in God we trust, you know, minor thing. And the same thing goes if I had to choose between getting rid of female genital mutilation and people saying stuff like throws like a girl, obviously one is a really huge issue and I would get rid of female genital mutilation. But that doesn't mean that the little things don't matter. When you have those sort of microaggressions, they add up over time. And they add up and they reinforce the big problems because then people can turn in the US and say, oh, well, we have in God we trust in money, and that is evidence that we're a Christian nation, so you shouldn't care about these bigger issues because obviously we don't have separation of church and state. And the same thing is when we're saying stuff like throws like a girl, or we describe speakers or video bloggers or bloggers as being awesome because they're pretty, not because they have intelligent things to say, that adds up to a greater idea of sexism and just reinforces that belief. But the other thing people don't realize a lot is that both religious belief and sexist beliefs are really hard to give up. Uh, and, you know, for example, 
how many of you in the audience, show of hands, you are, used to be religious at some point? Yeah, m most of you, I'd say. And then how many of you who used to be religious instantly uh, turned into being non-religious after one argument? Yeah, no one. <laughs> it, takes, it takes time to get rid of those irrational beliefs that are really ingrained in, in you, in your way of thinking, and it's in your culture. And sexist beliefs are the same way. They're really ingrained in you, and it's hard to overcome something that you're so used to thinking. And it's especially worse because, for example, I, was, I come from a family that's not religious, so I was never a religious person but we all grow up in a society that is sexist, and none of us are exempt from that way of thinking. I mean, I know I used to hold a lot of sexist beliefs. I still am constantly challenging myself to get rid of those sexist beliefs. And it's easier to you know, overcome the big ones first, which is why I think a lot of atheists feel like you know, we're the heroes for women and religion is the misogynist thing, because we can look at the really obvious things like female gen gen general mutilation say, yeah, that's wrong, even though most guys still want to talk about their penises afterwards, but we, we can agree that that's wrong. Uh, but when it comes to the little things, people have a harder time accepting that those are also irrational because you know, it plays an important part in their life. And I think one of the difference, differences between religious belief and sexist belief is that a lot of people, when they give up religious belief, they give up a lot of beliefs that make them feel bad, that make them feel guilty, that constrict their behavior, and it can feel really uh, like freeing in a way to be giving up that religious dogma and be able to be like, oh, I don't have to live my life this way, you know, it's okay if I'm gay, it's, it's things like that, it feels relieving. But that, that's true for, I think, women who give up sexist beliefs, but it's not necessarily true for all men who give up sexist beliefs because there are, there's a lot of privilege that comes with being a man that people don't, they're not necessarily conscious privilege, it's a lot of times unconscious, and having to constantly uh, re-examine that can make you feel like a bad person. It can be like, I'm, I'm not choosing to do this towards women, I'm not choosing for society to be this way, and so you see it as a personal attack instead of you know, trying to overcome it. And so it's, I see a lot of men who are unwilling to address the little sexist things in their life because it may not benefit them as much to uh, get rid of it. But the other thing is that you know, sexism affects men too. Um, and I think this is something a lot of people, a lot of men actually don't realize. Um, I try to talk on my blog, you know, it affects men in the sense that, you know, when things are called girly or feminine, it means it's bad. And so you, men get called girly as an insult and they have to have this hyper masculine view and set of attributes that they have, which is just as bad as, you know, assuming a woman has to be very feminine. But it's, it's just funny to me how many men don't realize how even the bigger issues affect them. Um, how many men who don't care about the abortion battles or contraceptive battles because they're like, well, that's a women's pro woman's problem if they get pregnant. And I was actually, I was ranting to my boyfriend about this. It was an international women's day and I just had a slew of news articles come in about all the new abortion and contraceptive, contraceptive restrictions that were being passed in the US that happened to be on that day. And I was just so upset about it. I'm like, why is there this war on women? This is ridiculous. And he, he turned to me and he said, he's like, it's like, this isn't just about women. I don't want you to get pregnant either. <laughs> and, and I, but yeah, you're good. <laughs> so, but it was like, that was one of the first times I heard a guy being like, yeah, someone getting pregnant affects me too. And I care about your issues, not just because, you know, I love you or care about you or like you're a sister or a girlfriend, but because, you know, these sexist issues affect men too. And I think because so much sexism is really ingrained in this sort of irrational thinking, that's how it sticks. And that's why it's so important that we keep speaking up against it because a lot of people, it's gonna take a long time and a lot of challenging of their beliefs before they change their mind. But it does work. Um, like I said, I started as an atheist blogger, so I kind of tricked in all these atheists into reading about feminism in a way because they liked me enough for the atheist stuff that they stuck around. And I get more emails from people men who say they are now feminists or have feminist ideals than they did before, than people saying they're atheists now than they did before. 
And that's really encouraging to me that a lot of them admit sometimes they had to read my blog for years before they finally got it, but they get it now. And so we just have to remember that, you know, sometimes, you know, we all start with these sexist beliefs and sometimes people within our movement, including leaders in our movement, are going to say sexist, stupid things. And it's not just to write them off, but it's to confront them and say, this is why you're wrong and accept when they admit that they're wrong. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're starting to get questions coming in, but I'm going to lead with a question you already know I'm going to ask you. Um, and that is why, why is the free thought movement, or at least the uh, so many free thought gatherings, conventions, still so male-dominated? For example, about two weeks ago, I spoke at something called a free thought festival that was put together by very nice students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And there were 21 speakers and four women, including myself. And they were very nice young men and one woman who put this together. And um, this is kind of c common. I mean, if you look, there's so, it's, it's lovely to see free thought flowering. There's so many local regional groups, so many student clubs, um, lots of things going on. But when you look at the roster of speakers, you know, you could pinch yourself if you're a woman. Um, and not, not always, but I think typically. And, and yet there's this contradiction that women have always been playing leadership roles in the free thought movement from the 19th century on, uh, creating groups, running groups, not, not always and not running all of them, but very prominent. Um, and so I guess I'm going to throw the question out to our panel um, about why they think this is happening and what we can do about it. Um, and some of the things that have been proposed, some of the uh, rationale for this is that uh, men do outnumber women when it comes to free thought as the American Religious Identification Survey does show. Um, um, and there have been more men who have written best-selling free thought books <laughs> than women. So that puts them, you know, there's a more prominent, we're going to, who's the prominent spokesperson? You're going to go to those bestsellers. Um, and so is this thoughtlessness? Is it not making an effort? Is it gravitation to men as authority figures? Uh, do we see the same issue with color and race being unrepresented or underrepresented? So what do we do to make sure that free thought is a welcoming home to women and minorities? And that's a lot to ask, but I'd say if you can respond in a couple minutes, and because we have other questions to answer. And can we just uh, take it in order? Or, oh. Oh. Well, I, I, just, I was sure. just going to briefly throw in, there we go. Um, uh, I'm going to steal from my own Twitter feed and say that I find it really interesting that when the topic of the conference is women, we explain the lack of men as a lack of interest in the topic. But when the topic of the conference is Bigfoot, we explain the lack of women as a lack of interest in rational thought. And I find it really amazing that when it's so obvious to us that the men aren't here because they're not interested in the topic. No one has suggested that the men aren't here because they lack the capacity to think. Uh, <laughs> and yet that's what we hear over and over and over again at other conferences. Um, but I'll turn it over to Siki. Actually, I want to approach this by um, really looking at why it is that African American and Latina women are some of the most religious folk in the United States. And that will get to why it is women are underrepresented within mainstream new atheists, secular humanists, what have you. Um, what are the needs that the church provides for women of color? Well, going back to the points that I articulated earlier, you have communities that are under siege with regard to the lack of living wage jobs, with regard to policies of educational apartheid, with regard to the gross representation of young people in foster care systems and amongst the homeless. And what institutions are fulfilling those needs for the most part for the mass numbers of working class black and Latino folk in the United States? It is in some degree, church institutions. So if we look at it conversely, where are the 
radical, progressive, secular, humanist organizations and institutions that are gonna fulfill that role in black and brown communities. They don't exist. So that's one point. The other point is we have to look at the degree to which new atheism has been powered by this fixation on scientism, which has in many regards excluded radical progressive voices of color and feminist voices um, emanating from the academy. And obviously the academy is dominated by European Americans in terms of those who have tenure in terms of those who have prestige and status and are getting publication contracts. So these are all things that need to be looked at in terms of the institutionalization of atheist scholarship um, as a canon that is accepted within a certain segment of mainstream America now. We have obviously the four horsemen of apocalypse model, um, you know, superstar white male atheists that have institutionalized a very narrow prescriptive white supremacist um, patriarchal version of atheism for the masses. So those are all things that foreclose greater representation of diverse communities. Yeah, I'm not, su I'm not sure um, I agree with what Sakivu just said. I'm not sure that the, um, the male, the four horsemen at least, and the, the male dominated version of atheism is scientistic. That, I think that's kind of a, um, a slur that gets thrown at them a lot by people who resent science itself and um, you know, the idea that science is a good thing and that thinking, not just scientifically but also empirically, um, wanting things to be evidence-based and basically using, using reason and using using skepticism and basically relying on the idea that you should have good reasons for thinking something as opposed to just taking somebody's word for it throughout your life. I think that's the core thing um, that's at issue here and that's, that's the, you know, that's central to new atheism and I don't think that does exclude either women or people of color. And I, I think we should be very wary of buying into the idea that it does because if we do that, um, we're basically sort of reinforcing the idea that women and people of color are somehow enemies of, of reason and of um, evidence-based thinking, and above all, of just of accepting the idea that if you say, you know, I know this to be true, or I have the absolute truth, or um, I have this belief and you have to respect it, that you need to offer reasons for it. And that, you know, that's a pretty minimal requirement. And I don't think it's either gender-based or class-based or race-based. I think it's just a basic human value that we need to defend. So, actually I want to respond to that. Because scientism is not a rejection of science. Scientism is a critique of the degree to which science has been positioned as this regime of totally objectivist knowledge. So the issue is that there are scores of scientists of color, as well as secular humanist thinkers like Anthony Penn, who comes to mind, that have critiqued the regime of scientism and the degree to which that has foreclosed an examination of how, say, Western Enlightenment emerged from a very specific trajectory of imperialism, of colonialism, of the subjection of bodies of color as objects of knowledge, as basically the antithesis of the universal white subject of reason, of empiricism, of positivism. And scientists like, for example, Joseph Graves, who wrote The Race Myth that I really recommend, it's an excellent book. He's a biological uh, anthropologist, evolutionary biologist, that is. Um, you don't really see his work referenced within a new atheist, secular humanist context. Pushes back against this notion that somehow reason and critical thinking exist outside of a specific historical, political, and cultural context. So that's where radical progressive humanists of color are coming from when we push back against scientism, not the uh, concrete verities 
of science in terms of science being a discipline, okay, not science literacy. All of those are things that radical progressive humanist feminists of color espouse. Scientific materialism is something that we espouse. But it's important to understand that peoples of color, the bodies of people of color, have always been situated within this context in which we were positioned as being the racialized and sexualized others within these constructs of the supposed transparency and veritudes of science. I'd, I'd just like to add to that, um, because FGM has come up a few times, and I should have mentioned this initially, uh, but I didn't. I, I don't want you to get the idea that men ask about male circumcision when I talk about FGM because that simply because they're only focused on themselves. Uh, there's a huge component of it that is just pure racism, pure othering of uh, women of color. And I suspected it for a long time and then that was confirmed when, after I made that YouTube video about the subject, someone sent me a message with his full real name. I checked out his profile. He subscribes to uh, the Richard Dawkins Foundation YouTube channel. You know, he's, he's, he's one of us, one of us atheists. And he literally said that uh, FGM might be worse on a case-by-case -case basis, but it doesn't matter because it's being done to black women in Africa. He literally spelled that out. And I don't think he's alone. I think that a lot of the men who want to focus more on male circumcision uh, than on FGM are doing so because uh, black women, particularly women in Africa, uh, impoverished women aren't human to them in any real sense and it's it's utterly disturbing and I bring it up because I, I want you to be disturbed too so you know just how deep the problem is and just to add one more thing about the whole science issue is that because of these historical reasons that science in the past has kind of abused different uh, non-white people, abused women, um, we still see science being very male biased. I mean, even my department's pretty good, uh, but I'm still outnumbered by men in my department. We have a group called Women in Genome Sciences where we try to counteract that. Um, we, we have one African American in our whole department of hundreds of people. And because the skeptic movement tends to draw historically from science-based groups, you're already drawing from a group that's male biased, and so you're just gonna have biased people that you're bringing in. But one, one thing I want to point out is that a lot of organizers and attendees see, they're, they're not proactive about including women. They sort of have this view that I'm not being outwardly sexist, so the women should just come. We're not saying no women allowed at this conference. Um, but they don't realize that, one, they are often being sexist, and they just don't realize it, but that, two, you have to be proactive, and that you get this sort of spiral of doom where if you don't have any women speakers, women feel less comfortable coming to your conference because it's implicitly saying that we don't care about women because we're not inviting them. And you just kind of get this cycle where if you have less women participating, then you have less women writing blogs and writing books and less women who therefore can be speakers. And I know a lot of women who do do speaking um, can probably share this, but we get invited a lot now because this is a, a big issue. People want to be more diverse. And so since there are fewer of us, we get booked really quickly and we, we can't fit in many events in our schedule. And so there's, there's a reason to be proactive in getting more women involved and then fixing the problem. But going back to the whole, well, we're not being outwardly sexist um, issue. It's just demonstrably false. Uh, to illustrate this, um, when I was about to go to my first um, big major atheist conference that I had been blogging for a while, I've been to like an SSA conference, but not like, well, SSA conference is big and major, but it's mostly student leadership focused and it's not like, uh, more about like, ooh, famous person, and thousands of people are gonna go. Um, and when I announced that I was going, 
Uh, unsolicited, I got many emails from different individuals basically warning me which male speakers not to interact with as a young woman. And they were all these separate women who had no idea who each other were telling me the same list of male speakers. And there's this kind of underground knowledge of who the sexist male speakers are. And when you get a bunch of women alone in a room together who have this knowledge, it all you get so many stories about the same people coming up. And for some reason, this isn't really public knowledge about who these people are, and they keep getting invited back to these conferences. And this is obviously a big problem we have if it seems like all these people know that there are certain problem individuals that there aren't being steps taken to make sure they have proper behavior around women at conferences. So, you know, part of it just being proactive, calling people out, and uh, trying not to have this cycle where women don't feel comfortable at conferences. Yes. Annie? Can I just do a quick point? Really, really, really quick, just to support what Jen was saying about the number of women at events influencing how many women are going to show up to future events. There's a very interesting study done uh, in the past two years, I think. I'm not sure exactly when, sorry. Uh, but it, it was a study done on um, students in science, tech, engineering, math, STEM students. And uh, these uh, researchers showed them uh, they, they split up the students into two groups and they showed each group a video advertising an event uh, for STEM students that they said that they were considering running. And one video had a 50-50 uh, gender ratio and the other video had, uh, I think, a one to three uh, with obviously more men, something mirroring what the actual STEM breakdown was. And the group, uh, the women in the group that saw the video with more men were much less likely to want to attend, and they also specifically said that that event did not look like it was something for them. Uh, men in both groups, it didn't matter, um, and women in the 50-50 split were much more likely to say that they would attend the event. So putting women up on stage uh, helps women feel comfortable in the audience, and I think we can see that here today. And it happens every time I do a Skeptics in the Pub talk, uh, The organizer will pretty much always tell me that this is the most women he's ever seen in an audience. So the science definitely supports that. Uh, there's a bunch of questions coming in. And first, uh, I wanted to read a nice comment. This is from Simon, I think. Is that Melody's husband? <laughs> <laughs> he said, as a male who makes an effort to purge sexist beliefs from his brain, my personal experience has been that it is quite a relief similar to losing religious belief, especially every time I encounter the macho attitudes of less enlightened male acquaintances and co-workers. So that's a little feminist testimony. <laughs> um, somebody said, can, can I give the statistics on um, male to women ratio and non-belief? And I no longer trust my memory. If somebody can Google heiress, I believe it's 60-40. Uh, uh, is some got that? That's right. Yeah, the American Religious Identification Survey, which has been done three times, um, it currently resides at Trinity University there, which I think is funny. <laughs> they have a, a secular uh, department now, and they do this significant survey, and it's that nice survey that shows that the non-religious are the fastest growing segment of the adult population by religious identification at 15% and growing. This is adults only. But so we saw about 60% of, of the uh, non-religious, they don't always call themselves atheists, which I don't think matters, um, are men and 40% women. So that was uh, Eris 2008 conducted in 2007. So hopefully in another few years we'll get another survey. I understand they're looking for funding for that. Um, and then we also see the Pew statistics on young people. It's a much, as much of a quarter of the population of 15 to 29 year olds reject religion. I do not know the stats on male, female. I assume they'd be pretty equal. Um, okay, so then, um, let's see. Um, it's kind of hard for me to. Of those who identify <laughs> atheists, the number is 70 30. So, oh, 70 30? Yes, uh, non religious at 60 40. Oh, okay. Who identified atheists is 70 30. Yeah, oh, did you hear that? 
um, they do actually ask uh, in ARIS, you can identify whether you're an atheist or not. That was 70-30. Now, uh, what uh, the major researchers is at ARIS pointed out is that people, um, it's not enough to ask if you're an atheist. What they ask is, do you go to church? Um, do you believe in a god? Um, do you expect to have a religious funeral? And then it's a lot more people who identify as non-religious, so I'm always a little skeptical of atheist. Um, be, you know, people self-identifying as atheist. Um, let's see, there's a bunch, of, um, I'm trying to find a unifying theme, I don't think there is, so let me just go with one of these questions. Um, what do you think are the most effective ways to model behavior and change this embedded perspective of women for the next generation? Um, the, t talking about, I guess, I'm not sure what that question means. Is the person here? <laughs> Uh, did you mean a, a secular, uh, yeah, did you mean uh, perspectives of, um... I was just, uh, uh, you know, culture tends to indoctrinate us, so we, we grow up with uh, visions of women's roles and men's roles, and uh, that gets reinforced then by the behaviors, that then gets reinforced by the behaviors of, of, of both men and women, um, and uh, so... So your you know, question to the so panelists. my question is what you know what do you what do you think are the best ways that we can you know although it's important to try to change adult behaviors or adult, adult thinking that's har that's a harder prospect than uh, than changing the perception of the next generation as they as they see women uh, doing th you know performing the uh, you know doing different roles and kind of how do how do we model the behavior that we want them to see? What, what do you Anybody want to take a jab at that? Okay, uh, so how do we change gender roles? <laughs> Take out your pens. <laughs> We're gonna do this. Uh, yeah, it's a very big. Uh, yeah, so how do you how do you model? Uh, I mean, it, it's it's difficult uh, because yeah, what we're talking about is a culture wide. Uh, belief system in a way. It's a it's it's the way we live. Uh, gender roles are so uh, embedded in our culture that, you know, we're, it's, it, even, it, for instance, when you raise a kid, a lot of people uh, want to model behaviors for, for instance, for their little girls so they know that they can grow up to be scientists or anything they want. They don't have to be princesses, but by age three, they are wearing the frilly tutu and loving the color pink. And they're like, what went wrong? Uh, and, and, and it's simply that, you know, culture is overwhelming. It is all around us. Uh, the the good news is that um, there there are signs that you can compensate for uh, for for bad stereotypes. Um, uh, that's a bit redundant, but uh, you you can you can compensate for the uh, the effect that stereotypes have on us simply by telling people about the stereotypes and debunking them. Uh, for instance, stereotype threat is a, a real problem. Uh, it's, it's what makes women, for instance, uh, perform worse on math tests when they're reminded that women are bad at math before they take the test. Uh, this has been done again and again and again in study after study after study. And uh, what researchers have found is that you can compensate for that by, you can remind women that women are supposed to be uh, worse at math, but then you can say, but the science shows that women are just as good as men. And that makes the women do better. And not only uh, do they do better, there was one study that showed that they did better than the men taking the test, implying that women have been working so much harder to compensate for the stereotype threat that when you remove the stereotype threat, they skyrocket ahead of the men. Uh, so it can be done, and I think that the the main thing to do is to simply educate children and adults about stereotypes and uh, a in order to compensate for them. And I just want to add um, a plug for a if you want to read one really good book on this subject, it's Cordelia Fine's Delusions of Gender. And she goes she goes into these these studies and it's it's very depressing stuff, the how insidious the stereotype threat can be because you can't, you can't fix the effect of the stereotype, and this applies to racial stereotypes and gay stereotypes, all kinds of stereotypes too. You can't fix it by spotting the priming and saying, oh well, but I don't believe that, because the very 
brain effort it takes, the cognitive effort it takes to say, I don't believe that, causes you to do worse, because it, it takes up cognitive function that you should be using for answering the test question. I think, um, coming from the education perspective, that one of the greatest challenges for feminist educators is really trying to grow feminist young men and culturally responsive youth leadership programs that really acknowledge that heterosexism and patriarchy and hypermasculinity are fueling intimate partner violence and sexual assault and HIV AIDS contraction um, are sort of on the front lines of doing that kind of work. So for example, there are some you know, really great articles, books, documentaries that have been um, written by scholars of color like Kevin Powell, like uh, Byron Hurt, who has an excellent documentary called Beyond Beats and Rhymes, where he looks at the hypermasculinist mentality with regard to young men of color and you know, really tries to insert a feminist critique into the mainstreaming of hypersexual, violent images of young women of color in hip hop and rap. And he actually has done a lot of you know, very frontal anti-violence prevention work with young men um, across high school and college campuses. So that kind of activist outreach where there again is an attempt to unpack how is it that these patterns of disproportionate intimate partner violence, particularly in communities of color that are underserviced as far as preventive resources are concerned. These patterns of violence you know, connect to this cool pose, this swagger, this hyper-masculinity that a lot of young men of color adopt as well as white men within the mainstream, which is why you know, we see you know, this uptick in terms of how women have been situated within the mass pornographic imagination, how that's really, really impacted these skyrocketing rates of STIs and HIVs in um, high school campuses and middle school campuses as well. Uh, one quick thing about role models, since I think most of the points I wanted to make were made, um, is that when we're trying to expose our maybe children or friends to certain role models of how to be you know, like good feminists and not necessarily conform to gender stereotypes, we have to be careful to not equate girly with being bad. Uh, and I know this is something that when I was a young feminist, um, before I really read any feminist literature, was something that I did. I consider myself a feminist, and in order to be a feminist, I did the opposite of everything feminine. I never wore skirts, I never put on makeup, I never wore high heels. I saw those as inferior things that people were brainwashed, and women were brainwashed into doing. I saw feminine activities as being inherently bad. And then I realized that is sexism. <laughs> that seeing feminine activities as being inherently bad is seeing femaleness as being inherently bad. That I was embracing all these masculine activities for the sake that they were masculine. Uh, so I think we just need to be really careful that we're not just saying, well, I'm going to do the opposite of everything uh, feminine in order to be a good feminist. That we have to make sure it's about choice and about making independent decisions about what you're interested in and how you want to dress and all those sorts of things and not just being reactionary to female things. So I think there's a series of questions here. Oh, what, how much time do I have left? Okay. I can't see that far. Um, <laughs> So, uh, actually, um, Sakivu, you started to address some of these questions that have come in, but there's some corollaries um, where uh, Christianity is so much a tool of oppression, um, but embraced by African Americans. How can, and you started to talk about um, the church and the role of the church uh, playing with the African American community, and that the humanists are not offering an alternative, this question is, how can the humanist movement more effectively reach this community more specifically? And also, uh, going along with that, um, uh, somebody said, Elsa, wherever you are, Elsa, I have seen objective thought and scientific reasoning used often to call into question the reality of sexism, racism, and dismiss minority experience. How can we combat it? So I think maybe all those questions could be addressed at once, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> quite a quite a heavy 
magic bullet. Um, I'm sorry, what was the first one? Um, well, <laughs> really basically, more specifically, um, the humanist movement isn't, isn't offering anything for African-American women that, that, they can't, that they're getting from the church. What can we do uh, to specifically? Yeah, so again, cultural responsiveness. Um, <clears throat> communities of, of color exist in such a state of siege given the devastation of the economic recession, given the realities of, again, mass incarceration and institutional racism, sexism, and heterosexism. And that's really the place to begin. The place to begin is providing some type of social welfare outlet that is going to be culturally responsive to the immediate needs of communities of color. So if you have a humanist organization that is going to engage with young women who are coming out of the system, who need reentry services because those do not exist in any meaningful way in this so-called American exceptionalism, Reentry services mean living wage jobs, access to housing, access to equitable education, because fewer numbers of African Americans are going to colleges and universities, not only because there's been a gutting of public universities with regard to funding and other regimes of authority, but also in terms of the abject state of our high schools with regard to college preparation, where you do not have college preparation that is equitable and accessible in terms of, in the state of California, what are called A through G courses. So if you don't have A through G courses and you don't have highly qualified teachers that are prepared to teach those courses and that are allowed to teach those courses, given, again, the downsizing of public teachers and their positions within middle schools and high schools, then you're going to fuel the school to prison pipeline, which means that young people of color are gonna cycle in and out of juvenile detention facilities, which brings us back to social welfare. What kinds of reentry resources can humanist secular organizations provide? What kind of extracurricular resources can secular humanist organizations provide in communities of color that do not have green space, that do not have public parks, that do not have community centers? So these are all intersectional issues, you know, that really speak to the devastation of the social welfare safety net in the United States. And so if there's no frontal political and radical uh, redress of that, then humanism and atheism are going to be absolutely culturally irrelevant for these communities. So before we go on, I... It seems to me that what you're saying is that, I mean, the government is failing and that the churches are seen as saviors of the poor or disenfranchised, but we shouldn't be looking to charity for basic human rights and civil rights, and that's really the problem. I mean, I think this is why the religious right doesn't want universal health care, because then they, they lose their role as, as helping the disenfranchised even though they don't do it. They, they're... <laughs> they're well, they know in Europe, they know in Europe where you do have this safety net that the churches have become irrelevant. So uh, the other thing I want to mention is, um, for those of you who are engaged in reproductive justice, highly recommend um, a documentary that was put out by Sister Song, which is an Atlanta activist organization uh, spearheaded by African American women. Now, this this pertains to the question; it's not off topic. Um, what they did in this video to to counter this assault on black women's reproductive rights with regard to these um, anti-abortion billboards and all the other legislation that I cited, is they actually partnered with an organization called the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Rights, which featured a lot of African-American pastors who laid out why they subscribe to the notion that abortion is a human right, is a moral right. What has the secular humanist and atheist community done that's similar to that? In terms of coalition building with like-minded activist groups that are on the front lines of these apartheid policies that really impact the lived experiences of communities of color. <laughs> 
Uh, now, and we're also opening it up to this general uh, idea of um, how to make issues that are considered secondary, i.e. women and minority groups, make them issues of the movement. So, I was going to add that when many people see religious organizations as being, uh, you know, the charitable saviors, there are also atheists out there who see, not only are we not doing enough, they think we shouldn't be doing it. I know I was infuriated at TAM last year where we had a diversity panel that basically devolves into a discussion about how racial and feminist issues, women's issues don't matter because they rather talk about the chupacabra. I mean, <laughs> they, they outright deny that these should be issues we care about, that these are issues you can discuss rationally, and it's infuriating. And related to that, they, a lot of people who are atheists or skeptics, skeptics also deny the importance of community. And I think that's something women especially need in these sort of charitable communities or just even social communities because women tend to be, and women and minorities tend to go to those communities for, again, charitable acts or even just it's their only source of socializing often. And when they leave those communities, they leave that behind. And it, it's so intricately tied between sort of the community aspect and religious aspect that uh, my, one of my favorite stories is when I was a, a freshman at Purdue, I was reading The God Delusion while I was doing laundry in the laundry room. And there was another freshman, female freshman, sitting across from me who um, I realized was religious. She had a religious necklace on. And she was just staring at me in horror as I'm reading The God Delusion. And eventually she worked up the nerves to ask me, you know, well, what's that about? And I said, atheism. And this time, this is, that was when I basically started calling myself an atheist instead of agnostic. I'm like, yeah, I'm an atheist. And she, she looked at me and very sincerely said, but then how are you ever going to find a husband? <laughs> and I think that, that really illustrates how ingrained sort of sexism and sort of the social aspect of finding a mate is in a religious community. So if we don't acknowledge that there's this community aspect that's lost when you leave religion and you start thinking skeptically that we're, we're gonna get less women, we're gonna get less minorities because they're so tied into that system. Now we have four minutes left and I think it would be appropriate to let um, all of our panels make a one-minute closing statement. So, <laughs> or if you don't want to, <laughs> you don't I have just, to. I just plan to second everything Sakibu says, so <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> oh God, we're trapped in some sort of recursive loop. <laughs> Okay, I've got something. One thing I didn't, none of us got to, I think, is um, popular culture and the way popular culture has eliminated women over the last few decades. And I think we can compare the absence of women, um, you know, on stages like this and at conferences and so on, to the absence of women in movies. I cannot count the number of times I see movie trailers these days and, go to, and say to myself, oh good, another movie starring a man, a man, a man, a man, a man, and a man. I think that's relevant. Uh, I guess one last thing I would like to say is that we need to feel safe in criticizing people, organizations that do and say sexist things. Um, I know a lot of the bloggers in the room have experienced this when they call someone out, they get endless, endless amounts of crap about that. And often that crap includes angry screaming phone calls and rape threats and death threats. Um, and this is not acceptable. Uh, there are people in this movement who are trying to silence people who speak out against sexism. And they do it in a way, not only uh, you know, through threatening ways, but even professional people do this um, and basically try to ostracize bloggers or writers from the atheist movement for speaking out against this. They try to make it seem that if you're gonna criticize famous person X who's more famous than you, you're never gonna get booked at a conference again and you're never gonna get your book published and they're not gonna write a blip for the intro page of your book. Um, and the only way to combat this is that more people need to speak out. So we become the majority and it's not one lone blogger or writer speaking out against it. We need to work as a force.
we're out of time. Thank you.